may be seated. Welcome Mr. Al to the platform for tour portion this morning. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Can you all hear me? Are we on? <laughs> Yay! Hallelujah. Okay. We weren't fit. Sorry. Hey, do you know why we do the weekly tour portion? Yes, Zach, because it's awesome. Do you know that by doing the weekly Torah portions, we are entering into the oldest Bible study in the history of the planet? That's because we are a Hebraic fellowship which recognizes our connection to the commonwealth of Israel because we have pledged allegiance to Israel's Messiah. And according to the Apostle Paul, because of that, well, we have a debt to the Jewish people who compiled the scriptures through whom comes the Messiah and who are now, right now, fighting for their lives in a war of existence. So continue to pray for Israel and pray for the peace of Jerusalem, our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, they, they need it. They need our prayers. So I'm going to now talk about uh, Toldot. That's the portion. It's called Toldot. It means generations. And by the way, did you know that Messiah Yeshua himself was reading and studying through this same Torah cycle 2,000 years ago. So that's why I say it's the oldest Bible study in history. It's still going on. All right, so as usual, I'm going to get to this in a roundabout way. I want to start talking about the Pentagon Chapel, the Pentagon Memorial Chapel, which was a very important part of my life during my years on the Army staff. It was the site of weekly prayer meetings and a favorite stop on tours I gave to friends and family. On one occasion, my guests were two men who had served the Lord as pastors and teachers in many places around the world. Now, at the chapel, they asked me to pray over them. I don't remember what I prayed, although I'm sure I asked God to continue to bless their ministries and make them more effective servants of his kingdom. But when the prayer was finished, one of the men looked up at me with tear-filled eyes, and he said, Al, you're the real deal. That was a compliment that surprised me. I had prayed from my heart what I thought that, or what I understood the Holy Spirit to be saying. But something had caused this man to consider me a man of honor and integrity, That's the kind of man I try to be with everyone. And it may be that my efforts to be honest and upright stood out because this man had rarely encountered honest and upright people, even in ministry circles. I imagine my friend had met pretenders among religious leaders and congregants. I've met such people, and I've suffered hurt from some of them. They are not the real deal because the faith they profess is one of convenience or habit, not a faith born of genuine transformation. So whether they're in it for wealth and power or to fit in with or stand out from the crowd, there's something missing in their relationship with the Almighty. I've kept this story to myself because I don't want to boast. God gets the credit for any qualities of righteousness he's developed in me. But his work isn't yet finished. And that's why I take Paul's counsel seriously from 1 Corinthians. But because of God, you are in Messiah Yeshua, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and holiness and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in Adonai. Paul took this advice from something God had explained to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, he says, Thus says Adonai, let not the wise boast in his wisdom, nor the mighty boast in his might, nor the rich glory in his riches. But let one who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. For I am Adonai, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these things I delight. 
Now, those who identify as God's people should want to do the things that delight him. So why do we often do the opposite? And that's why Yeshua reprimanded the spiritual leaders of his day, saying, woe to you, Torah scholars and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin. Yet you have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, justice and mercy and faithfulness. It's necessary to do these things without neglecting the others. This is why Yeshua cautioned the people to do what the religious leaders taught from the scriptures, but not do what they did because they were not the real deal. They taught one thing, but they did another, just as hypocrites have done in every age. Realizing this has helped me understand the many failings of our spiritual ancestors. Quite often, they teach us how to live righteous, godly lives by showing us what not to do. It's um, easy to grasp those lessons when they do obviously wrong things, such as when Isaac lied to the Philistines about Rebekah, saying she was his sister and not his wife. I understand why Isaac feared for his life, anticipating that some Philistine would be attracted to Rebekah and might kill him if he knew she was his wife. So we blame Isaac and Rebekah for a lack of faith. They demonstrated a greater trust in deception and manipulation than in Almighty God. How many times, though, have we made the same mistake? That's the point of the story. It's supposed to make us question ourselves and seek correction. So our lives better reflect God's definitions of righteousness and justice, mercy and faithfulness. But it's more difficult to understand the lessons when we see our ancestors pursuing righteous ends by unrighteous means. That's why the story of Jacob and Esau makes me uncomfortable. It's difficult enough to relate what the Bible says about God loving Jacob and hating Esau even before the twins were born. The best way I can deal with that is by understanding our creator is the only one who sees the hearts of human beings and who knows the end from the beginning. Somehow he knew Esau would be the bad seed of Isaac's family. And therefore, he designated Jacob as the rightful heir to the birthright of the covenant he had established with Abraham. But what do we do with the way Jacob acquired the birthright by persuading Esau to sell it to him for a bowl of stew? Jewish teaching says the boys were 15 at the time, and the stew Jacob prepared was for the ritual meal of mourning at the death of their grandfather Abraham. It's unlikely the transaction happened without anyone's notice. So why didn't Isaac and Rebekah do something, either to nullify the deal or confirm it? Why did something done by a hungry and short-sighted adolescent determine the course of his life? And when the time came for Isaac to pass on the birthright blessing, why did Rebekah and Jacob deceive both him and Esau to ensure that the birthright came to Jacob. For that matter, was Isaac that gullible to believe Jacob was really Esau? Or was he playing along with the scheme in a passive-aggressive effort to name Jacob as his heir without confronting Esau? None of that seems very righteous or just. As the story goes on, we see Esau in a lifestyle of willful disobedience and disregard for the holy things of God. By the time Rebekah and Jacob went through the deceptive theater with Isaac, the twins were old enough to be grandfathers. And Esau had married into the wicked Canaanite culture instead of taking a wife from within the family as Isaac had done and Jacob would do. Jacob was clearly more worthy than Esau to receive the birthright. But why would God allow his people to pursue the right thing by unjust means? Maybe because the stakes were that high for the future of humanity. Or maybe to help us understand how God will have his way, even though he's working through corrupted vessels. 
we don't like this story because we see that same corruption in ourselves. However carefully we try to do the right thing, we still make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are grievous to ourselves and others. That's the sad reality of human beings who have both wheat and tares growing in our hearts. Sometimes we can't tell which is which until much later, just as with Jacob and Esau. Esau held on to his anger and never changed. But Jacob tried to make things right with his brother, demonstrating by his actions that he had become a righteous man. So it comes down to what kind of relationship we have with our creator. Abraham opened himself to a transforming relationship with the Almighty, and he taught his children to do the same. That's how Abraham's family has become a blessing to all the families of the earth, even though he and his descendants made many mistakes. The course of his life demonstrated that he was the real deal, just as we will be when, like Jacob, we learn to do the works of Abraham.